the heart speaks uh, to you. So that, that's coming up. Now we've been in a series called One Blood, looking at God's desire for a multi-ethnic church. We've set the biblical foundation. We've talked about the prayer of Jesus, the pattern in Acts, the Pauline mystery. We've talked about unity doesn't mean uniformity. Uh, we said that we're to walk worthy, and that in a multi-ethnic church, as we're following Jesus together, at some point, there's a 100% chance that you will be offended uh, somewhere along the way. Like, it's just someone's going to say something, do something, and that gives us an opportunity to walk worthy, to walk worthy, that we looked at in uh, Ephesians last week. Now, this morning, we have, we're going to have a panel conversation, let me just stand in front of our, our panel this morning, and... And the hope is that we would, we would learn from one another, we would um, get to know some of our story a, a little bit, we, we would listen, we would um, hopefully be able to move forward as a church and, and what it looks like to be a multi-ethnic church. Um, and so I would encourage you to maybe take some notes this morning. At the end, for our last question, you will have an opportunity to give input into the conversation uh, we'll have a QR code up and a place where you can type in a quick question or comment. And I may not be able to respond to them all today, but we want, we, this is a, a family kind of conversation. And so we want everyone to, to be able to contribute. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to get started, and I'm gonna, we're going to go around, and our panel is going to introduce themselves and uh, where, where they're from, and just a little bit about their, uh, their church background as well. And we're going to, uh, let's see, start here, start there. Uh, John, would you mind just introducing yourself and where you're from? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to us this morning. Um, so uh, my name is John. I've been, in, I've been here at the Hills uh, about a year now uh, with my wife and kids, my over there. Um, and in terms of a little bit about, like, you said church background, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, where, you, where you grew up? Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. So um, I grew up in Naperville, Illinois, outside of Chicago, um, and grew up uh, in a Christian family, grew up in church. Um, I grew up going to um, a white non denominational church, which I'll probably share a little bit more about later. Um, and uh, yeah, grew up a, grew up a Christian, um, and in high school, I feel like my faith kind of became my own, and that was important to me. I ended up going to uh, Christian college. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica, um, and I um, am a 1.5 generation Asian American. Um, and so that means that I was born in Taiwan, and I moved to Colorado, actually, at the age of nine. Um, my dad came here to pursue graduate school. And... Um, so I grew up in Colorado and ended up moving to Chicago uh, for college and then moved down to Philly to work for a few years and then went back to Chicago for graduate school. Um, my family, um, my husband and my two kids, we actually moved back to Colorado from Chicago this summer in June and we started coming to this church in November of 2020. Right. So Norbert, Norman, and uh, 1.5, that's a good one. I, I'm also 1.5, I did not know that. But I'm originally from Romania and moved to the States when I was 10. So that also relates to, yeah, to my church background. Um, so I grew up in an evangelical church. I think it gives the African American church a run for its money because we did like four to five hours of services. And then Monday, Tuesday, and all through the week, and we'd like church all the time. So um, that's the background I had. Um, we moved to Colorado about 11 years ago. And been going to the hills for a couple of years. Thanks. Hello. Hello, everyone. You're one second. Can we get a louder? Yeah. Jesus. Go ahead, Jackie. Test, test. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, my name is Kristen Maddox. Um, I grew up in the wonderful state of South Kakalaki. South Carolina to anyone else who hasn't heard it phrased that way. Um, so I'm from the, from the Deep South. Um, growing up, uh, went to a predominantly black church until about fifth grade. Then we transitioned to the new flashy uh, production church. Um, 
non-denominational white church uh, when I was in about sixth grade where I got saved um, and started like kind of taking my faith for my own. Um, so I've been in predominantly um, multiracial, multi-ethnic spaces since then and multi-ethnic churches since then. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. And then also, I started coming to the Hills about a year ago. Well, thanks. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna ask questions and they're gonna answer the questions. And uh, we talked beforehand just uh, kind of what we, this conversation to go and they provided the feedback on the, on the questions today that we've, we've had as well. Uh, but just to get us, get us started, um, who would like to answer, how has your, your culture ethnicity informed your faith journey? How has your culture ethnicity informed your, your faith journey? Anyone want to start us off? Um, just as an immigrant, um, we um, grew up in the Chinese church. My family, we, it was about 20 congregants, and we met in the basement of a rented space, and it really was a safe haven where everyone spoke the same language, we ate the same food, we didn't have to explain it to anybody. Um, and as the congregation grew, there was sort of an English translation component, and so we kind of moved back and forth between speaking in Mandarin and then also speaking in English. And I think when I think back to that time, like a really vivid memory is you know, being able to see the verses of a song in two languages, right? Understanding the value of understanding who God was through sort of multiple ways. Um, I don't think I really understood the um, impact of my ethnicity and culture on my faith until I stepped out of that space, and that happened in college when I started going to a multi-ethnic church. You know, sometimes when you're swimming in something, you don't really realize, um, you take it for granted. And um, at that time, I realized, looking back, how much how much my understanding of Christianity was really shaped through this Asian culture, right? Um, the, the pastor was always talking about sort of obedience, keeping your head down, working hard, you know, sitting through the discomfort, and don't worry, God's going to save you because um, you're going to work hard, right? Um, you know, like this idea of becoming a good Christian and a good Asian immigrant was synonymous. They were one and the same, right? We lauded kids who went to Ivy League schools, you know, kids who obeyed their parents. And I think I, it wasn't until I went into a multi-ethnic space where I realized that's that's just one version of the gospel, right? That's one slice of it. And um, in college, I began um, sort of serving alongside folks in community organizations and being in places where justice and injustice was really at the center. And that led me to ask these questions about my faith, like, what does my faith have to say about this? What does God have to say about this? And hearing other people's perspectives really helped me understand um, a much fuller picture of what the gospel was about and sort of how myopic my own view was from that really singular lens. Um, and so, you know, the question is about how faith and um, ethnicity and culture were related. It's, it was totally inextricable. And I think it, it was hard to realize until I stepped out of that space. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to share how your uh, culture, ethnicity has informed your, your faith journey? Yeah, so my, so I'm biracial, so my dad is white and my mom is black, and so I have white side of family, black side of family. And uh, I grew up in a, in a white non-denominational church in the suburbs of Naperville. But um, maybe like once a month, uh, we would go to the church that my mom grew up in, uh, Greater Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Chicago, uh, black church. And, um, and so from an early age, I saw and experienced multiple ways of, of, of doing church and, and living out faith with God um, in two different uh, cultural contexts. And, um, I mean, things like the music, the way people relate to each other, uh, the sound level, um, how, what kind of food are you eating after church, and what are you doing, and, um, what, what does prayer look like, and, and all of those things I experienced from an early age, just uh, different ways of, 
of, of worshiping, of, of being church and doing church together. And I think that, um, and I think that kind of speaks to some of my own uh, like ethnic and racial identity in terms of drawing in different um, experiences and trying to think through uh, who am I and what does that mean for me. But I think it's brought an openness uh, for me in terms of thinking through what does it mean to live with God? What does it mean to walk with God? Um, fast forward, so when I was a young professional, I was at a conference, and it was a Christian, it was a Christian conference, and someone was talking about uh, Hapa racial identity. So they yeah, uh, kind of thinking through uh, mixed racial identity and what that means. And there was uh, a bunch of people in the room who I could tell had a lot of mixture in their life, um, ethnically and racially. And we were just talking about um, our lives and talking about trying to make sense of different traditions and cultures and, uh, and, and identity. And I realized in that moment, oh, I'm home. I'm home. Um, and so that was, a, that, was a, that was an insightful uh, piece for me. And then one more story. A few years later, um, uh, I, was, I was working with a, with a student who was um, Afro-Latino. And he's like, you got to read this book. you got to read this book. And uh, i gotta, I got I to look up the name of the book now. But um, it was about uh, multiracial identity um, as a Christian. And the author, she puts forth a story, and I believe it's Titus, um, and how uh, Titus had a mi mixed ethnic um, mixed ethnic background, and kind of looking through the story of Acts and some of the other stuff, um, how um, God used Titus's multi ethnic background um, to serve God's king, and um, and so in off of that, uh, the author says your mixed ethnic background is part of God's purpose for God's glory. That's good. And I remember reading that, and I remember just crying, reading that. And, um, and I, I'm getting emotional now. And I think it speaks to the importance of, of, of one's ethnic identity and seeing how God not only delights in our ethnic backgrounds and in our cultures, but he has a purpose for it in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the purpose of here. Thanks. Would you like to speak to that question? No, don't, don't have to. We have other questions coming. But. Um, yeah, just a quick, I guess, answer to that. I feel like growing up, um, being in the South, um, being typically one of the only black people in the room, or maybe there were a sprinkle of us. Um, I think that really impacted the way um, and shaped the way that I viewed the Bible, the scripture teachings and everything um, in a way where um, I feel like a lot of times I didn't see myself um, in, in that church or in that space or I feel like it wasn't until the last probably six years I really started to digest and dissect what it meant for uh, each person to be made in the image of God um, and how me being a person of color is made just in the image of God just like anyone else. Um, so I feel like that is kind of what shaped me, like just really um, reviewing kind of like Rich Valoda's talks in um, The Deeply Formed Life about reviewing like how you've been formed because when you are in a, a space that really um, doesn't uh, have a lot of diverse voices in the room or um, just, you know, has a global picture of like what uh, the global church looks like. A lot of times it comes from a very focused or uh, Eurocentric view of who God is and what his church should look like. So it, it, I spent a lot of time trying to fit into a mold that the Lord never meant me to fit into because he made me, created me in his image alone and I didn't have to fit into a mold. Um, of what humans created to to be a part and partake in the table. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. And I just, I mean, before we go to the next question, I just want to thank you all for being willing to, to share personal background. Like that's not 
easy in a small group, let alone in front of people that some you know and some you don't. So thank you for doing that. Um, what if, uh, who could speak to uh, some experiences with others of different cultures and ethnicities? Like what is interacting in, in some of these spaces? What's that, what's that look like? What's that felt like for you? So I'll, I'll do a quick start on that. Um, being a Caucasian person in the US but from Romania is like very confusing, right? Because you think like, well, you should belong because there are a lot of other people like you. So I don't have like that issue of like, oh, I'm the only one different here. But we are very different. And um, I, I think the differences when we start really paying attention to our, our culture, our ethnicity, especially depending on your personality type, I kind of brush them aside because maybe I'm not an introspective thinker enough. But when you start thinking about them, and I'm thinking, when we came to the States, probably a little bit like you, our church was very Romanian, and we were very different, and there were those American people, and the way we did church felt like 10x holy to everybody else doing church, and, and you don't realize how you're developing these, I'm different than them, and either worse or better, and how that creates um, basically your journey with God, at least it did mine, and then being able to relate to other people. And I thought, when Pastor Matthew asked us to even think about this whole concept, I'm like, well, I have nothing to share. I mean, everything's fine, kind of. But then I started thinking deeply across two dimensions about culture and ethnicity, in that there are massive differences when you start thinking deeply about them. And if I, as a Christian believer, desiring to share God's love with others, can't think deeply about this and start relating to others and all the pain that's going on, then who? So that, that was very reflective for me to say, yeah, actually there are many more differences than I'd initially give credit. And it was a bit of a journey to even think about that. Oh, thanks. thanks. Yeah, who, who else? What are some experiences with others of, of different cultures and ethnicities? Of, of how we relate across across race and how we understand each other, how we kind of like reduce each other. Um, maybe specifically white people can like reduce those of other races and ethnicities um, to kind of stereotypes. Um, I think uh, in college, I had uh, one of my friends was from Ecuador, and. And I think through, in, in my residence hall, and I think through having conversations about uh, where we grew up and what kind of food we ate and what some of our experiences were like, I realized uh, there are different ways of seeing the world. There are different ways of seeing the world. And 
it was it's in mo it was in moments like that where I realized, okay, I'm an American. I've grown up in America, and that shaped who I am and how I see things. And um, I think uh, relationships like that have really opened my eyes to kind of uh, yeah to different ways of seeing the world, which is kind of connected to different ways of seeing God, different ways of living out faith um, that have been important to me. It makes me, so as you're speaking, I it's kind of a, a question, maybe the, this is not on the, the list here, but we want to honor people's culture without making assumptions about people and their experiences. So I wonder how, how do we, how do we do that? You know what I mean? Like there's, you don't want to make like, oh, you're from this culture, so you must be this way. At the same time, I want to make space for the culture that you may be coming from, and it's different than, than where I come from. So, how do we do that in an honoring kind of way? I yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that, and I think um, when we kind of distance ourselves from each other, it's really essentialized, really easy to essentialize people and to tokenize people um, because you have that one experience and you use it to generalize. Right? That's part of human human experience. Sure. Um, and so I, I think it's so important for us to be in community together and to have real relationships with each other. Because I think that texture and that nuance and all of those individual stories um, come out when we're actually in an intimate community together. And when we share our stories, our joy, and we grieve together, um, that's when you start to really understand what that individual's experience is. And it's really hard to do that, um, I think, on a given Sunday morning. Because as beautiful as this community is, um, we can step in here and just leave, right? And we can feel like we've done some of the work because on Sundays, most churches don't look like this. Um, but I think that part of the work is really happening between, uh, on the weekdays, uh, is trying to figure out who are you going to call when, um, you know, you just experienced a microaggression at work. Um, who are you going to call when you need some prayer over what's going on with your family? So, yeah, I think really intimate communities is one of the places to do Yeah, and I, I love how you hit on that because I feel like in a lot of times in those situations, um, people try to honor, uh, I guess, other cultures by almost tokenizing, oh, I have one black friend, I have one Asian friend, I have one Latina or Latino friend. Um, and it's is really gets deeper than that. Like, are you actually doing life with those people? Or are you just using it to be like, oh, I just have one friend that looks like this or acts like this. Like, are you actually doing life with them? Like you're saying, who are you praying with? Like, who are you you actually bringing bread with and like going to in, in those moments? Um, which I think that's something very important that you just hit on. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, can you share a little bit of your journey with being part of a multi-ethnic, multi-racial church? There, there was any tensions there, or there was a vision? Good, bad? Like what, what has that journey been like? It's hard, <laughs> sometimes. Um... Something that I really think about, because um, like just concerning like multiracial churches, a lot of the times like the diversity in those churches like rely on the backs of people of color, um, and that's when we see like that tokenism like we were talking about uh, take frame. Where a lot of churches, I feel like the intent is like, oh yeah, we want to pursue diversity and do all these things, but then. They only invite like one person of color to be on the leadership team or um, on the teaching team and all those along across all those lines. And instead of like you know Jesus is the vine, um, and instead of like allowing him to be the mission and centralized in that, uh, when pursuing that diversity, a lot of times it it makes it like rely on the back of like one grape on the vine when it should be something shared amongst the church and something carried amongst the church and um, as a burden across the church. Um, so I feel like just being in a lot of spaces and places, 
um, in different multiracial churches. I, I've seen that a lot um, of just, you know, make, making the vision of a diverse church or a multi-ethnic church, multiracial church, rely on the backs of only the people of color for us to share it amongst each other. Thank you. So a, a quick extension to that, um, one of the churches we did, amongst many churches we've been to, uh, Romanian church in America, basically assimilating and they had translation for the Americans, they put headphones on, and so it was a massive church, and so we had different races for sure, but uh, the American and the Romanian and trying to come together. And thinking back on that question, there definitely was a, well, collectively as a group, we want to be diverse and engaging. But the cliques that were very clearly evident, even when I was young at the time, it was quite evident that at the individual level, there wasn't a lot of, at least engagement to like go deep and say, hey, let me learn about you, let me hang out with you, let me go have dinner with you, whatever. Um, so I, I think as a church, if I were to say, it's easy to have that overarching, let's be diverse, but it takes a lot of individual reach from every one of us to like want to go and say, hey, how are you? And let's learn more. Tell me your story. I want to know about you. And to, to have that kind of engagement, to have it almost organically be diverse versus just holistically, theologically, hey, we're trying to be diverse. At least that, that's what comes to mind from my experience. And yeah. I would argue we're slightly different here. So for me, this is the first uh, multi ethnic church that I've, that I've been part of. So, I, um, so yeah, I grew up in a white denominational church. Uh, in college, was a part of a few different churches, all predominantly white. Um, I learned about multi ethnic church. I believe in college, I, I believe it was a, it was like a conference thing, and Brian Lawrence was there. Um, and I was like, oh, that sounds that sounds really cool. And, and I think it was the next year, um, you know, Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson, and, you know, that was a big moment. And I realized, for me personally, okay, like, issues of, of racial justice are really deep, and this is not going to be something that's, this is not going to be something that's all over that. Um, and, um, and so, me and Laura got married, and, we moved to Arkansas, and I think on a, on a trip we went and we saw Mark Demazis' uh, um, church in Little Rock, a multiracial church out there. And I was like, man, this is awesome. This is so cool. Um, and then we were like, man, we need to be a part one. But where we, where we were, we were like in a remote area, and it, and it didn't make sense. Um, and uh, so fast forward, we moved here to Colorado, and... Uh, 2020, um, you know, George Floyd's murder, and you know, in my whole life and things that I'm learning, I kind of came to the point where I was like, I need community, I need Christian community with other people of color, and I need to be discipled by other people of color. Um, and so I don't, I'm not sure if I can do much more of just, just white church. I'm not, I'm not sure if I can do that anymore for my own soul and where I'm at in my faith. Um, and I feel like I can speak to that because I've done my whole life. So <laughs> it's not like I'm you know, writing it off. Um, and so uh, that was a journey for us in thinking through what do we want in a church and what multi churches are out there and what fits for us and our family. Um, but that was some of our own journey even getting here. Sure, sure. But I think um, prior to moving to Colorado, um, as a single person and also as a married couple, we had gone to another multi-ethnic church that was a little bit older than the Hills. And it was a pretty intentional decision on our part to be in that space, um, partly because of the experience that I had growing up in an Asian church um, and some of the experiences that I had in college that kind of opened my eyes and sort of troubled my understanding of what the gospel was. 
Um, and so I think some of the most powerful experiences that we had in that in the multi ethnic church in Chicago was is in the pandemic. Um, and you know, going through the pandemic and um, just realizing how many injustices, um, and in particular, this is a church in a black, historically black neighborhood. But um, you know, when when another young black man dies, um, you know, and is shot, it's there's this there's a sense of collective mourning of people who did not look like that man, who did not live in that neighborhood, and how powerful it was to grieve together, to understand and empathize with each other, and then when um, um, all of this sort of Asian American hate happened, understanding what it felt like to um, sit in a space where we could also just not have to explain ourselves and we could just just warm. And so I think those experiences and, and a bunch of things that came before it really convicted us that um, a space like this could help us better understand the fullness of who God was. And I think it's what keeps us here is understanding that the, the experiences of people who did not share our same cultural background and same life journeys and being able to see how God was the one thing that really bound us together. Um, that said, I think I also face a lot of tensions, um, especially now as a mother of two kids, thinking about what is their identity development going to look like in this space? You know, how are they going to honor their cultural heritage? Um, wouldn't it be easier if I just went back to my home church, which my mom is always trying to convince me to do, right? Why don't you come back here? We can eat the same food. They can experience, you know, they can talk to all those aunties and uncles and X, Y, Z, there's so much of yourself that you don't have to explain in a space where everyone looks more like you. And so it's a tension, it's an intentional decision, but it's also a tension that continues to sort of simmer inside me about, yeah. you know, what do we, what are we gain and what do we lose? Why are we here? Um, really thinking about that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a, a study that, that came out about multi-ethnic churches and the experience of, of people. And what the study showed was that not everybody experienced multi-ethnic churches the same. And there, there was, uh, it, it kind of shined a light on, on some things that um, Kristen kind of mentioned. us like this tokenism or like having to fit in to like the majority culture and not being able to, to see scripture, see yourself in, in scripture. Um, and the, one of the, the ladies who was part of the study She's a sociologist at Ohio State University. She, she wrote an article in Christianity Today. And if you've been part of the Hills Church, I sent an email this week with a link to that, uh, to that study if you wanted to read that, or to her article. And then so she, she paints a picture of like some things that have not gone right in multi-ethnic churches. And, and, uh, but then at the end, she ends with some hope. And here's, here's what she says. She says, multiracial churches are to be places where every person's belovedness is embraced and celebrated, where every person is able to come to the table with their gifts and skills as leaders and contributors to advance the good news of Christ, and where no form of supremacy other than the supremacy of Christ reigns. That's Coy Little Edwards. Uh, and so the, the final question, and this is the question that if, if you have feedback on for us as, as a church as well, we'll put up a, a QR code, put up a link, if you can see that. So it's you probably can't see the link now that I'm thinking about it here. That's low. Uh, the link is thehillsdenver.com, thehillsdenver.com slash convo, or if you wanted to, to jump in. But the, the question is, for the, for the panel, and then if anyone has his input as well, and this is for going forward, things we want to be, be thinking about. It's like, what, uh, what might it look like to pursue this vision as the Hills Church, and what are obstacles we might face? So as we pursue this, this vision that, that God's given us, that we believe is biblical, um, and that Jesus prayed for, the early church was a pattern for it, what, what does that look like for us to pursue that? And what obstacles might, might we face? And some of the things you've already hit on and some of the other answers, what, what's needed, the community, but like, if there was any, any other ideas around this question. Hello, it's me. Um, I think obviously a, a great thing is, um, or not a great thing because it's not always right, but a good thing to do together as a church is lament together when 
those injustices happen, kind of like Monica hit on and John hit on. Um, just making sure we're in a, a true genuine space where people can be real about how they're feeling and where they're at. And then also like being able to come alongside people that don't look like you uh, in that and pray, um, pray together um, and hope for a better outcome. Um, so I think that is a, a huge part of having that beautiful vision that you just read in that, that quote where people understand um, each other's belovedness and that they're made in the image of God and that inherent human dignity that the Lord uh, ascribes to people when he creates them and knits them together. I think lamenting together is a, is a big part of that picture. Yeah. And I, uh, it, it's hard and it's been a journey for me as, as a, a white guy. Like when I see stuff in the news or I see like a white guy who's been shot or, or for some reason, like I don't, I don't feel that. Like, it, you know, it's, it's a stranger. It's because typically in white culture is very individualistic and we don't quite have that same, same feel. Um, and so, I mean, to, to hear, I mean, your, your input and, and your stories on that and lamenting and the stories of, of a, being a part of the people who lamented when, when things happen, that's, that's helpful for, 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 me to, for me to hear. Like, it's, it's a different experience being black or being Asian or Latino. That, in, in America, it's a different experience. And so I thank you for, for sharing that. So all the it goes this way, right? Sure. So a um, couple of things. I, I really liked your mom's uh, inquiry. Hey, why don't you come back to this church because it's comfortable? Um, I, I think even though for some of you who know me, I'm more of an expressive personality type. I'm also a human, a creature of comfort and consistency, and I want to have something different because it takes energy. For me to engage with people that are different than me, of course it takes more energy because all of a sudden I have to like think through their lens and um, the white evangelical Christian in the U.S. Um, has a very different mindset than what I grew up with and that's a little harder for me to engage with than others. In other cultures I find it a little easier but I, I think collectively to have that intentionality and don't be so fooled by your ethnicity or race. Find out who people are different than you and like desire to spend time and learn with them. That is really hard, that's, that's uncomfortable. And I think if we are to ever really come closer to this one blood concept and understanding that we're different, but you know, we're one blood in, in Christ, then we have to really start going in and saying, no, actually I'm gonna skip this Sunday from my Asian church and I'm gonna go to this other church despite your mom's request. So I, I feel like I get that a lot as well because it's so easy to just be comfortable. Uh, that would be my thought process. So building on what you just said, I think there's um, a lot of value in creating room for difficult conversations. And I don't really know what that looks like. I feel like, you know, we're in a micro church right now and it feels because it's just so much smaller that things can just bubble up really naturally when you're having a cup of coffee or trying to wrangle your kids um, into in, into the conversation. And so, I'd love to think about what that might look like for us. What how what it means to create those spaces um, where we can have those. We can lean in and like name the thing, right? Um, I think part of it is sort of just not as making assumptions of one another. And I think it could really help create sort of this shared vocabulary around our personal experiences. And I think that's part of the work of, you know, really getting to, to know one another on a deeper level. I think one of my fears always in these kinds of spaces is that um, that we, we think about pursuing diversity for diversity's sake. And I think the value of being in a Christian space in particular is it begs this question of like diversity for what? Is it for whom? Is it for the white people who come here and say, look at all these wonderful people that I'm friends with, right? Um, part of the diversity is, I think it's a, it's a starting point maybe. It's, it's, a, it's a surface level indicator of where we're at. I think it's when you dig into the everyday life of what we're doing and who we're talking to. That's where the true sort of, this understanding of who we are and why we need God and why we need each other, that's where it shows up. Yeah, one of the 
things that I was thinking about in terms of uh, what obstacles we might face. I think it was brought up in terms of struggling with uh, tokenizing and maybe tokenizing people of color or a particular ethnicity. Um, and to what extent do things, or rephrase it, things change when um, people of color are in leadership positions. Things change. And I don't want to emphasize like, kind of particular roles per se, but I think when, when we uh, have leadership expressed um, from different cultures and backgrounds, and, and that leadership is supported, um, I think that creates spaces for um, kind of more, more uh, complex understandings of our different ethnicities and backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the one of the obstacles I think is just thinking about the I guess U.S. context is um, a lot of uh, popular kind of teaching in, in books and whatever content, it's from white evangelical voices, to be frank. And so uh, so there needs to be the work of, of centering uh, those uh, uh, people of color, other ethnicities and backgrounds uh, in different perspectives of what it means to, to walk with God. Um, and I think the challenge of that is that we're kind of always looking to, all right, what, what's, what's out there, but we're not, not necessarily centering um, different perspectives, we can kind of get stuck. Yeah. That's really good. So, a, a quick comment, because you said something that if you'd asked me a few years back, I would have said, well, that makes no sense. You said a statement of things change when you have a black person in leadership, or when you have a woman, or when you have different people in leadership. And I would have trivialized that statement a few years back. But the more I spend a lot of time in my work life about the emotional language and the signals that we send, you could have the exact same logic for two different people, but the emotional expression of that logic connects differently with different people. And you, we connect emotionally way more than we can connect logically. So I, I just want to explain that for some of you who may have gone or are probably going through this journey. Those things make a difference because there's so much that is unsaid but it's said to the emotional expression of how we communicate. That's what we need through diversity. Yeah. And we've, we've had conversations. Uh, I was in our, our microchurch, and so if you're not in a microchurch, you should probably be in a microchurch, because <laughs> we have some of these, these deeper conversations um, about like being in spaces, John, where you don't have to explain yourself like, and how helpful that is. Like You can just, uh, especially around uh, some of these uh, tragedies, um, that the black community has faced, like you don't have to like set up qualifiers, like you can just go and like what that what that looks like. And, um, any any other things you would say? Challenges or obstacles? Yeah, I think um, I think another obstacle is kind of uh, maybe to go out there a little bit. I think another obstacle is thinking that we can thrive as a multi-ethnic church and not consider social and political issues of justice. I, I, I'm not sure if we can do that because, you know, 2020 George Floyd, black exodus from churches, from multi, uh, multi-racial churches, right? right. And, and I think, so I, and I think that that probably makes all of us a little uncomfortable, perhaps specifically white folks uncomfortable, of considering, ha, oh, we gotta think through issues of justice for our community, precisely because these things are impacting us in our community. So we need to create spaces for lament, we need to create spaces for what do we do as a church to respond to these things. Um, but that, that implies that we have a robust and multi-vocal uh, perspective on justice and faith. That's right. And once again, if we're just listening to white voices on that, we're, we're, we're gonna be behind. We're gonna be behind. That's good. Um, so I think that's a challenge, but there's hope in uh, that there are, we can connect across racial and 
and ethnic backgrounds on issues of justice, can walk through life together, can lament together, can pursue justice together, but uh, it requires pick up, all of us picking up our cross in our own way. piggybacking off of that, not assuming that it's going to be like an easy, beautiful process. Like, it's going to be hard, and there's going to have to be, like Monica was saying, those those hard conversations, those difficult conversations. But it, it might be one of those things where you, you need to leave that comfort conversation in the moment just for your own peace, but being able to come back to it and, and actually, like, come back with a level head, um, with reasonableness, which... Um, one of my favorite verses is in Philippians 4 about um, be known for your reasonableness. Um, so I think that as a church, we also need to come to terms that like it's not going to always be pretty because uh, as you probably have realized, if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, it ain't a pretty process. So I think uh, that's something to also give ourselves grace in. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I've, I have received... Uh, Several, several comments from online, so thank you everybody. Uh, I've received those and, um, and have some comments about taking, doing what's right rather than what's, what's easy. Uh, comments about our uh, worship that's reflective of different cultures, different music, hymns, bilingual songs, um, having some, some pair of, of different micro churches uh, just to get some, some different conversation going. More cultural celebration and conversation, inviting more cultural traditions into our group service and micro churches, actively challenging our assumptions um, and some of the obstacles around our, our comfort, our own biases, our, our limited understanding. And so, as as you reflect on this conversation this week, if if there was things that you think about that you want to add to this conversation, this this link will, will be up, and we we do like this is. A journey we've, we've been on as a church, and this is the end of this particular sermon series. But it's not the end of this. Like this is like, oh, we, we're there. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Um, this, this is an ongoing uh, conversation, and um, and and for for people of color who are part of our church, uh, I mean, your your voice, uh, your uh, like, we want it, we need it. And we want to be intentional without tokenizing, uh, and that's. And I hope like we're, we're moving in that direction. We're moving in, in that direction. That is my prayer. So can we can we thank our our panel? Uh, this thank you guys. Is there any final like oh I wish I would have one one thing you haven't said yet that you're like oh I would like to add that and Peter and Dallas we have one. So I'll, I'll just underline a point that you said at the end that this is the final ser sermon topic, but not the final of the conversation. What I've learned is, and watching the social issues and the challenges we face in, as a country, this problem will forever either get slowly uh, more remedy or it will actually get worse. This, this domain of being diverse and being inclusive doesn't just stay steady and it's never resolved and it always could be resolved a little better or a little worse but it just takes constant energy to push towards it having more results. So I just see it as very dynamic and ever going. So hopefully that's probably not. Yeah, thanks. I think I'll say too, I think conversations like this are needed. Once again, I, I don't think we could thrive as a multiracial church never have intentional conversations about race. I just don't think it's going to happen. Because yeah. because because then we're just going to all have sidebar conversations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, trying to trying to catch up for what's not happening formal. But I think that the formal can support the informal. The intentional can inform the support the spontaneous so that if we're thinking through what are intentional formal conversations and activities that we can do that can spark the more natural, like online conversations that aren't necessarily structured, but that will benefit all of us. Yeah, well, that's good. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you guys. I'll let you return to your seats. We just put on your chairs. Can we can we say thank you? Show our appreciation one more time.
me just we're going to conclude with the communion. I think in these com- conversations, one of the one of the the best things we can do is is come to the table together. And so let me I just share one one verse. I've shared it multiple times in the, in this series. But it's from Ephesians chapter three. And the whole context in this chapter is about this one new humanity, Jews and Gentiles who who couldn't really stand each other. They didn't socialize together. They weren't trying to be diverse for diversity's sake. Like that wasn't what they were about at all. Uh, so in, in that passage, in that right at the end of that passage, Ephesians three verse twenty says, "Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine." According to his power that has at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is not a work that we can, can do in our own strength. This is a work of work of the Spirit as we pursue being a church that reflects God's kingdom and we elevate voices and we look forward to the day when we stand before our God and together. Different languages, tribes, nations gathered together and crowd holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So we're going to move to a time of, of communion. And you don't have to be a member here at the church to receive communion with us, but if you believe the realities of, of which we've been, been speaking in just a moment, we'll invite you to come to taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. So today when we partake of the the bread and of the juice, we're recalling Christ's death. We're looking back to his death, but we're also looking forward to when Christ comes again and, and makes all things so we have individually wrapped communion, so we're going to, in just a moment, we'll all stand. This section here, you'll work your way around here. In the middle, you'll work your way around in the circle here. And on this side, you'll work your way around. Uh, we have individually wrapped communion, and as you return to your, your seat, uh, you can receive communion. You can take a moment of prayer, a moment of reflection, a moment in worship. So brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God given for the people of God. Would you please stand? Would you come forward and receive communion?
as you demonstrated what real power looks like. Humbling ourselves. Jesus, would you help us to humble ourselves that we might honor one another, we might celebrate one another, that we would mourn with those who mourn, and we would rejoice with those who rejoice. that you would work by your spirit that we would live out the truth of the gospel that we are one family one blood God that we would lift up the one who is oppressed that we would search for justice where there's been injustice that we would come alongside one another and and carry burdens. Jesus, we need you. We need you in this. For your name, for your glory, for your renown, would you do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine just for a moment we're running late on on the time just want to make you aware of a few things Uh, hopefully you received a worship guide when you came in there's a number of uh, upcoming things to make you aware of this coming Sunday not tonight next Sunday night we're having a prayer and worship night be very simple it's at East Denver Church of God it's at 7 o'clock and that week we have a group of 25 college students who are coming for the week they're going to be helping us uh, do different outreaches in, in the neighborhood, and they'll be joining us that night. And, and there's something about being around the college people who are on fire for Jesus that has a way of encouraging your own spirit. Uh, so it's, we, there's no child care or anything, but if you want to bring the kids, um, they're welcome to, to join as well. So that's next uh, Sunday night. Next Friday, we have a family fun and discipleship night at, at Lava Island. You can sign up for that. We need, if you want to come, we, we need you to RSVP for that. We have an upcoming Pie with the Pastors. Pie with the Pastors. That's for anyone new to the Hills Church. You've never been to the Pie with the Pastors. We just get to know you know, a little bit, share a little bit about the, the Hills Church. Um, and we do pizza pie and sweet regular pie. What do you think of pie? Uh, but we'd love for you to, to join us there if you're new to the hills. There's a sign up at the Connect table. You can also go online to our events page uh, for all of our events at RSVP. Get more information there. Uh, and then at the end of this month, there was a documentary called Unspoken. Unspoken. And this was put out by the Jude 3 Project, which uh, the Jude 3 Project, it, it helps, it's geared towards a, a defense of the faith from an urban or from a black context. So some of the things that, that Kristen was, was talking about, like not seeing herself in scripture, in, in the stories, uh, the documentary is going to shine some light on that. So we'll have a, we're having a screening of that as, as well. So a number of things going on. It's all on, online on our, our website. You, you all look very good today. You look good. You look good. Would you, would you stand as we conclude with the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Face towards you and give you peace. 
the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, grace, mercy, and peace be with you.